Welcome to our sexual harassment unit. This is the first of two lectures, as are all of the lectures that I have done um, so far. Please note um, that this particular lecture is really going to be dealing with definitions and some examples, as when I talk to individuals, uh, college students, people in organizations about sexual harassment, there are often an awful lot of questions about what is actually sexual harassment. We know it's bad, we know we shouldn't do it, and we know it's something that we should stop if we see happening. But what is it? So let's get started. So across the literature and in practice, we hear a lot of times that organizations claim that they are gender neutral, right? Uh, issues of power shouldn't come up based on an individual's gender. Uh, everybody has equal opportunity no matter what their gender is. Everything is fair and it's an even playing ground. Other organizations claim that they are gender blind, meaning the quality of your work is never evaluated based on your gender or your biological sex. Instead, uh, gender isn't even a construct that we even recognize in the organization. Something else that comes up very often is the issue of sex, which is very, as you've uh, noticed, sex and sexuality are inherently tied to issues of gender and gender identity. Uh, as we talked about a little bit in the professionalism unit, Sex and sexuality, those kinds of things, are very inappropriate in a professional setting, or at least we perceive them to be. Organizations, uh, pretty simply put, uh, try to come across as these kind of very clean, uh, gender-blind, sex-free containers where people are simply doing work and not engaging in discussions of sexuality or recognizing each other's gender identity. However, I think it's pretty well known, uh, certainly it is in the literature, but I would say across um, kind of the United States, it's pretty well known that organizations are not only gendered, but they're highly sexual. Joan Acker, who you read and, and uh, who others have talked about in this class, uh, was one of the first and the most famous to point out that organizations are saturated with issues of gender difference, sexual harassment, displays of sexuality, and issues of basically intolerance towards people based on their gender identity or their sexuality. Those of you who saw the screen kind of pop up and you see this YouTube video that I'm circling down here are going, aha, Mad Men. Now, while I've never actually seen this show, which I realize makes me lose credibility to much of you, I'm well enough aware of what is happening in this show to understand that uh, this is a really good example of issues of gender imbalance and sexual harassment happening in an organizational setting. Now, several of you are probably thinking, well, come on, that show was set in a time period where these kinds of behaviors were seen as less reprehensible. However, please bear in mind that these things did happen, though perhaps not in this mediated way. And additionally, it kind of gives us some insight, the show does, into where we came from as a society. So let's take a peek at Peggy Olson in Mad Men and her experiences with sex, gender, and sexual harassment. So, extreme, certainly, but also a fantastic example. 
All right, so let's move into the definitions very briefly here. You're going to run across several of these different terms as you read the articles, particularly in the first section, but throughout the entire unit. So I want you to be aware of what it is that we're talking about when these different terms come up. Now, bear in mind, sexual harassment has come to be a bit of an umbrella term for all of these different kinds of harassment. However, uh, they vary in extremes and intent. So the first thing I want to talk about is a really extreme version of sexual harassment, which is known as sexual violence. This is going to become very, very poignant in Kate Harris's piece. Um, sexual violence is, are issues of rape or forms of sexual assault, intimate partner violence. Violence is the key word here. Then there's another kind of, of uh, sexual harassment known as sex-based discrimination, which is essentially exactly what it is. it sounds like. An organization or an individual discriminates against another because of its biological sex. And finally, we get to the two different kinds of sexual harassment defined and acknowledged uh, by the United States government and kind of universally across the United States. The first kind is quid pro quo, uh, which is kind of translated into this for that from Latin. The idea here should be fairly simple. Somebody in a position of power for example, a manager, a boss, an owner, um, offers something to, to a subordinate, an employee, a lesser manager, something like that, um, with the expectation that for that perk, whatever it is that it might be, a raise, a new office, something like that, that they're going to somehow get a sexual favor in return to make it even. Uh, although this is a really kind of gray area, very rarely is it that you hear of incidences uh, where a manager or boss very explicitly says, hey, I'll give you this really nice office if you uh, if you sleep with me or if you do the sexual favor for me. Um, there are cases where this happens. Most of the time, however, and this is where uh, the confusion, the stigma, and the kind of gray area of sexual harassment evolves, um, when it's an implicit expectation for a, re a reward, um, many times people are afraid to report sexual harassment because they're afraid they have misinterpreted what is actually happening here. Am I getting this raise, this new office, whatever, because of something I did because I'm a good employee? Or are there strings attached? And then they, if they're, because there's issues of power here, they're afraid to report it because uh, there's something at risk for them. They might lose their job. They might lose face in the organization. The second kind of sexual harassment generally talked about is this the idea of the hostile work environment. And the idea here is that comments, jokes, um, touching, these kind of behaviors happen so frequently and are so pervasive in an organizational setting that the person that or people that are receiving this harassment are no longer able to do their jobs um, in the way that they're supposed to according to the organization. Again, you can see where this becomes an issue of gray area. Did I misinterpret that joke? Did I misinterpret uh, this person's comment? Did something happen and, you know, I'll, I'll lose face, I'll be made fun of, I'll lose status if I report this particular event? Um, please bear in mind, however, both of these are regulated by something called the reasonable person mandate. And the idea here is that um, if I describe this event to you, if I describe the situation to you, a reasonable person, and you too see it as sexual harassment, it becomes labeled as such. Again, lots of gray areas and an issue that needs to be continued to be addressed as we continue to discuss issues of sexual harassment. Now, sexual harassment became really important um, and tied to Title IX uh, after its development in 1972. This was legislation that was really designed to target uh, sex discrimination, which we talked about a few minutes ago. Again, that's discrimination based on a person's biological sex. I hate reading PowerPoint slides, but this is the thesis of that legislation. No person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal or financial assistance. Now, primarily you hear about Title IX in relationship to universities and athletic teams. In LSU in 1996, there was a, an incident of uh, where Title IX was reported, the women's volleyball team uh, was basically defunded because of scholarships going towards other uh, men's sports, and that team got very upset and filed a Title IX complaint. 
However, I want to make it very clear that even though whenever we think about sexual harassment very often and statistically accurately, men are harassing women, it can absolutely go the opposite way, and these are not protections just for women, it's for everyone. So, for example, in Western Kentucky, men's scholarships were starting to decline as more scholarships were being offered towards female students. The men's team uh, pointed out that this was a Title IX violation. Now, uh, there are two kind of uh, issues that are very popular right now that are uh, very um, influential and should be discussed at least here to bring the, um, the conversations to your attention. First, uh, transgender students. Now, all of the verbiage in Title IX uh, talks about sex, biological sex, not, um, not gender, which hopefully at this point in the semester we've all come to realize are not synonyms. Uh, transgender students, however, are saying, you know, perhaps we were not born of uh, the biological sex that we feel we should have been. Does this mean that we are not protected by Title IX? What does this mean in terms of placement on teams, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Please know that as the conversation, the social conversation about transgender individuals, identity negotiation, and legal repercussions and ramifications have become far more common, uh, transgender students are also uh, being protected by Title IX pretty much across the board. The second thing we, need, we should also bring up is Title IX, again, had far more of an impact on female students than male students because traditionally female students were kept out of, of athletics and Title IX developed as a result of that inequity. However, um, there still seems to be a pretty large inequity here, which is a conversation that has really been sparked again once the United States women's national soccer team won the, the world championship. So... You know, there's a lot of conversation about how this team was very talented. They were the, the world champions. Uh, and then several studies came out to show how far less coverage women's sports were getting than men's sports, how much less income and revenue uh, women were earning and creating as a result of their athleticism. Now, the argument on one side, and this is me summarizing because I want to make sure that you have time to read your articles, the argument on one side is that because women do not uh, bring in as much revenue from fans, they shouldn't be paid as much, nor should they be given enough airtime. But the other side of the argument is that this is a catch-22. Women have only had access to athletics at the college level, much less at the professional level, since 1972, which is pretty recent history. The very fact that there's a tradition of male males in sports itself creates a bias and an inequity of opportunities for female athletes. So if we're in a system set up that is exclusively designed to support male athleticism, of course women are going to earn less and have fewer opportunities. If we're not showing televising on the internet or on TV, whatever, uh, women's sports, of course we're not, they're not going to bring in as much revenue because they're not shown as much. It becomes a catch-22. I understand both sides of the argument, but please understand, and I'm not taking a position here, but please understand how influential Title IX is to this particular debate, particularly when we're talking about sex discrimination, a form of sexual harassment. Something else I really want to bring into the conversation is the issue of sexual violence on campus. Now, Title IX was originally, again, designed to address issues of sex discrimination, but sexual violence and sexual um Harassment are also issues that Title IX has come to cover. The ACLU made a very strong argument beginning in the early to mid-90s, along with several other national but smaller organizations, saying that students that are being sexually harassed or the victims of sexual assault or sexual violence, they are experiencing, experiencing an inequity to education, right? They are preoccupied with their safety, with getting over a trauma, um, with trying to negotiate issues of sexual harassment, and thus are in a ho essentially a hostile work environment, or they could be experiencing quid pro quo um, harassment. So I wanted to kind of introduce you to this thing called the Cleary Act. Now, many times we get emails from the Mizzou uh, Police Department called Cleary releases, right? Well, the history of that is pretty big deal, and it has a lot to do with Title IX and sexual harassment. So the Cleary Act, which was once uh, originally called the, the Campus Security Act, was um, named such in 1986 after a young woman named Jean Cleary was raped and murdered in her dorm room. And the issue here was that this happened, it was a tragic event, the man uh, guilty was finally caught and admitted to his crime, but the problem was 
the university had lots of uh, information about, you know, robberies happening around campus in that general area um, and hadn't told anybody, uh, particularly its students and certainly not its parents, that this was an, an issue on campus and near campus. Which is why when we get those Cleary releases, it's for crimes that have happened on or near Mizzou's campus. And the parents were so upset that the university withheld this information that it is now legally required by universities to disclose whatever crime has happened on campus so people can be aware and be safe and hopefully, um, and hopefully uh, remain that way. So if any of you are ever interested in knowing kind of what's going on, not just in terms of sexual harassment, but any crime on campus, Mizzou is very good and makes it very easy to find these pieces of information right here. Something else that you should know, and we're going to bring this a little bit closer to home, is uh, sexual violence here at Mizzou. Now, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the university's pretty much brand new har sexual harassment training and the mandated reporter training that all of your instructors, all staff, all faculty are required to take and agree to. This was a pretty big deal, and the university is taking a very strong stance against issues of harassment and sexual violence. One thing I want to make it clear that for all of you to know is that any any of us, um, if you have witnessed some sort of sexual harassment, if you have experienced it, please feel free to come talk to us, but know that we are under a, we've signed an agreement saying that we will mandatorily report this to the university, not for issues of shame or stigma, which trust me, I understand can be very, very challenging to negotiate. However, the idea here is that Mizzou wants to open up the conversation about sexual harassment and sexual violence on this campus. It's something that we can hopefully do something about, whether it's towards men or towards women, and know that we have all gone through this training and we'll hopefully be able to um, assist you through this process to the best of our ability. Something else that you should also know is that university undergrads have really taken to this as well. And MSA has started a campaign in the last year and a half or so called Enough is Enough. And they have a pretty powerful message for not only other undergraduates, undergraduates but staff as well. Please know that this is how seriously your university takes this. Please have a great afternoon, and I will see you for the next installation of Sexual Harassment Unit 6.